We may or may not be experiencing technical difficulties. You may never know. <laughs> no. Welcome. I am so glad that you guys are here. Um, we are part in this series we're calling Unseries because Brandon gave us teachers free reign to preach on whatever we wanted to preach on. So I- I'm excited you're here. I, I really enjoy today's topic, and I- I'm glad you'll get to hear it. So um, have you ever been laughed at because someone thought you were kind of a fool? I'll give you an example. Um, there's certain times I, I, I've read a word in stories and books, whatever, and I've read it in my head over and over and over, but I've never said it out loud before. And so I know how I pronounce it, but I don't always know what the correct pronunciation is. Give you an example. There's this word spelled H-E-A-R-T-H. Now, growing up, I would read that in like the Laurel Ingalls Wilder books or any time in historical fiction. Anytime there's a fireplace, you have and H-E-A-R-T-H. <clears throat> and I would pronounce it in my head, whenever I saw it, I would say, hearth, because that's how it's spelled. Um, but one time, after I was married, I said it out loud around my wife, and she just laughed at me. <laughs> because apparently, for those of you who don't know, apparently, like me, um, the correct way to pronounce it is hearth. Which doesn't make any sense. Not sure why it's pronounced that way. It doesn't even look like a French word, so not sure why it's pronounced that way, but hearth is apparently the correct way to say it. Another example. As a kid, um, my mom would give me spelling quizzes. One time she asked me to spell the word meringue. Meringue, and I'm racking my brain as this 10-year-old or however old I was trying to think about, I don't remember studying that word. How do you spell meringue? And eventually we got through the test, and she's like, see this word right here, and she pointed it on my list. I was like, Mom, this is Marin Goo, because that's how it's spelled. My family still makes fun of me for that one. I think it's ridiculous. Crazy French, right? Ah. Anyway, but have you ever been laughed at or, or may, maybe thought a fool because of your belief in Jesus or your belief in the Bible? Now, I bring this up because I think more and more in our culture today, uh, Christians are being made fun of more and more. There's this thought, and it goes like this. The assumption is that if you believe in the God of the Bible, if you believe in miracles, if you believe in Jesus, uh, then you must have your head in the, sta- in the sand. You must be intellectually dishonest. You, you, you must be a fool. I mean, I mean, the thought is that we're crackpots for believing in this stuff. Um, it's cute that we have our religion. It's great that we have our faith to fall back on as a crutch, things like that. But, you know, strong, modern, scientifically-minded men these days, they don't need religion. They've grown beyond the stories they were taught as children. And so that brings me to our question today. What if the stories aren't true? What if the story isn't true? And that's what I want to address today. I'm really excited to bring this to you all. But how do we even begin to answer this question? Um, when, when we think about having faith, what, what does that look like? What does it even mean to have faith? And I look at um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where the writer says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Not seen. Now what would that lead you to think of? Maybe blindness? Maybe blind faith? Is, is the writer of Hebrews calling us as Christians to have blind faith? Is that really what it's it's saying? Uh, And and so I I read that and I struggle with it a little little bit because it's like, okay, so if I I encounter an objection to Christianity or if I encounter a doubt in my own mind, what am I supposed to do with that? Just hang on tighter? Just read a little bit more and, 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 and just believe harder and try harder? Because what it makes me feel like is blind faith is the better faith. And if you go looking for evidence... If you go looking for answers to the objections or to the doubts, then maybe it makes you kind of a lesser Christian or have weaker faith. That's kind of what it feels like to me. Now, I don't believe that's what it actually says, and, and we'll get to that, but, but here's a little bit of what that kind of il- what I want to illustrate. Um, this is a habanero pepper. It's not a ghost pepper because I'm not insane. Um, But encountering an objection to Christianity or encountering a doubt to the faith is a lot like encountering a habanero pepper where you eat it. Yep, one more time. Here it goes. 
where you eat it, and it burns, right? And it's just there in the back of your mind sometimes. And getting hotter and hotter. And it can really eat away at your faith. It can really dig at you. And if we encounter an objection or a doubt to faith, like we encounter a habanero, maybe, by saying, I just got to hold on tighter, just got to muscle through it, without looking for evidence, it's a lot like eating a habanero and having a nice big glass of milk right next to you and deciding not to drink it. I'm a man! <laughs> oh, that's such a good idea. And I'm so glad this, it's not a Yeti, but <laughs> it kept the milk cold through all three services, so that's pretty good. Here's what I would submit, and we'll go into depth on this, is that we are not a call as Christians to just hang on with blind faith. But there are answers. There is evidence out there to answer the heat that builds up in our minds as we encounter objections and doubts. Isn't it funny how it doesn't hit you all at once? <coughs> anyway, um, and so <laughs> I'll come back to you. Consider Peter's position when he writes, in 1 Peter 3.15, he says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. See, Peter encourages us to be ready to give a reason for our hope, to make a defense against objections, against doubts of the faith. Mm. And it is so much better when we do. <laughs> so, so that's Peter's position, is that we should be ready to give a defense. We should be ready to make a reasonable argument in defense of the faith. But what about Jesus? What would Jesus do? Because there was multiple times where, say, the Pharisees or teachers of the law asked Jesus for a sign. They asked him for evidence, and he said no. Right? And... and and it's almost like he, they were asking him the wrong question. It's like, I'm not going to give you evidence. But, but what do we see when we actually look at Jesus' life? In John chapter 14, he writes, uh, John writes, Believe me, Jesus is speaking, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Read that. It's like, it, in other words, Jesus is saying, believe my words. But if you don't want to just take me at my word, Take into account all the miracles I've per been performing around you all these years. See, Jesus was offering evidence. He was offering proof that he was who he said he was. He didn't expect his disciples at that time to just stare blindly into the future and have blind faith. But even then, he was giving proof of himself. And, and in Acts 1-3, we see even more. Jesus presented himself alive to them, to, to the followers, after his suffering, by many proofs, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Even Jesus pro provides evidence, and we are called to give evidence as well, or to be prepared to give evidence for our faith. When the habanero comes, when the doubts come, when the objections to our faith come, there are good answers. There's milk ready and waiting for us. One of my fears is that a lot of us don't even know the milk exists. <laughs> and so one thing I want to do today is we're not going to have time to go over, barely even scratch the surface uh, of what we're going to talk about, but I want to pique your interest. I, I want to show you a little bit of what we can do with this. So... Um, my first point here um, is that, as Peter says, always be prepared to make a defense. Be ready to say what is true. Be ready to say what is true. And, and some of that is going to take some practice. Some of that is going to take maybe some reading or some research or some watching some apologetics videos, which, which we'll talk about and stuff. But be ready to say what is true. And when Peter says, always be prepared to make a defense, the word he uses is apologia, which is where we get the term apologetics. Now, here's what apologetics is not. Apologetics is not saying you're sorry for being a Christian. 
The word apologetics and apology nowadays means something different. We're not apologizing for being Christians. That's not what apologetics is. Apologetics is not arguing for argument's sake. If you win an argument as a Christian, that doesn't make you more holy. That doesn't make you more righteous. I, I think sometimes when we're maybe on the internet, maybe on Facebook, Twitter, or wherever you do your thing, um, we can think that because we presented a factual argument and, and busted them down into the sand that everything's going to be better. But apologetics is not just about arguing for argument's sake. It's not just about winning an argument. And then apologetics, the third thing, apologetics is not 100% necessary for evangelism. And here's why I say this. I think probably for the majority of us, maybe not all, but probably the majority of us, a lot of us, if, if we're followers of Jesus, came to Christ because of a relationship that we had where someone shared the truth about Jesus with us or maybe a conviction that we had, that the Holy Spirit convicted us internally of sin and drew us toward the hope that we have in Jesus. And, and so I don't think apologetics necessarily giving a reasoned argument in defense of the faith is 100% necessary for evangelism because God, through his Holy Spirit, can work in a lot of different ways and meet people in a lot of different places in life. Here's what apologetics is. Apologetics is presenting a reasoned defense of the faith. Presenting a reasoned defense. Logical arguments, actual evidence, and giving and being prepared to say that in, in, in an understandable way. It's presenting a reasoned defense. Apologetics is clearing the path for many to come to faith. It clears the path for many to come to faith. And I say that because I think it's true that I think maybe even especially nowadays, more than ever perhaps, the heart cannot accept what the mind rejects. And so if someone really does have a true intellectual um, block or wall about believing the Jesus of the Bible, about believing the Bible in general and believing that God exists, something like that, how are they going to come to faith in the first place? And so apologetics, while not 100% necessary for evangelism, it can be a really critical piece about clearing the path, getting rid of this junk, getting all the obstacles out of the way to clear the way for someone to come to Jesus. It's about clearing a path. Um, the third thing, apologetics, is part of growing as a Christian. You know, we're called to know Jesus more, to trust him more. And one way we can do that, one way we can do that, is to know more about the evidence for the truth of the Bible, for the truth of Jesus and the gospel. And it's, it's easy to come to Jesus and then to just go on with your normal life, attending church maybe, um, maybe you even sing songs, um, but do you know that you know what you know is true? That's what apologetics is for. It's helping us to know that what we know <laughs> is true. And then the fourth thing, apologetics is contextual. And what I mean by that is it, it, a, a true apologetic argument meets people where they're at. A reasoned defense of the gospel meets people where they're at. Because someone who has an objection to Christianity might be objecting because they had a bad experience with hypocrites in the church when they were a kid. Maybe their family was treated poorly. Or, or, or maybe for someone else, it's because someone really close to them just died. And they're struggling with idea, this idea of why is there pain and suffering in this world? That was a good person. They shouldn't have had to suffer all that time. Or, or, or maybe there's someone who has... <coughs> excuse me... <coughs> As those doubts creep up, creep up, be ready to give a defense. Um, but maybe there's someone who has, maybe has a, a doctorate in physics or something like that and is struggling with some of the concepts about how God created the world or the origins of the universe in general or something like that. You're going to be presenting a different reasoned defense of the gospel to each of those people. So apologetics is contextual. It meets people where they're at. <coughs> This is what apologetics is. It is biblical. We're called to be prepared to give a defense for the faith. And, and with that being contextual, meeting people where they're at, my second thing I want to say is that how you say what you say is almost as important as what you say. I'll say it again. 
how you say what you say is almost as important as what you say. I say almost because if you're not going to say the truth in the first place, then it's useless. It doesn't matter how you say something. But if you have the truth to say and you say it in a way that can't be heard, that people won't listen to you, then what's the use? How you say what you say is almost as important as what you say. You're going to be mean, and, and that's why I think that maybe making a lot of these arguments on Facebook or, or Twitter or things like that are oftentimes useless because people can't hear your tone of voice. You can't clarify maybe if, if you there was a slip of the tongue, slip of the typewriter, whatever, and you used the wrong word or, or something like that, and it's very difficult to actually meet people exactly where they're at in a space like that. How you say what you say is almost as important as what you say. We have to say it in a way that can be heard. So what does this look like? What does it look like to give an apologetic, maybe for a specific objection to Christianity? And that's what I want to do right now. Um, like I said, we're not going to be able to do anything more than scratch the surface, but I, I want to bring you through one of the possibilities. What if you meet someone, maybe a coworker, maybe a family member, who says, Jesus never really came back to life. The gospel writers were just liars. How do you handle that? What if the story isn't true? How do you handle an objection like that? What would you say? So the first thing, um, there's four different facts about Jesus and, and his death and everything that nearly every New Testament scholar accepts as being factual. Um, whether, whether they're Christian or not, basically all New Testament scholars agree on these four things that Jesus was crucified and that he was buried in a tomb that everybody knew about. The tomb of, uh, of Joseph of Arimathea. That's who it belonged to. Basically, everybody agrees on that. He died and people knew where he was buried. The second thing is that his tomb was empty. All the scholars agree on that point, all, that the tomb was empty, where they knew he had been buried. The third point, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, believed that he appeared to them bodily resurrected, physically bodily resurrected. That's what the facts say they believe. Not making a judgment call on whether that was true or not, but that's what the facts say. And then the fourth thing, his disciples' lives were transformed. They were different people after this experience than they were before. So these four things, again, basically every New Testament scholar agrees on, whether they're Christian or not. The issue becomes, what, how do you interpret those four facts? And, and this is where some objections to the re resurrection come in play. Um, one theory is that Jesus never really died, but he swooned on the cross. It's called the swoon theory. That after being beaten, after being whipped, after blood loss, after being nailed to the cross, after having someone poke a spear in his side and water and blood come out, that he didn't actually die. But anyway, it's called the swoon theory. We're not going to go into depth here. You can see I have some objections to that objection, right? Um, just offhand. Um, there's so many issues with it. A, a second objection is that all the accounts of Jesus being resurrected were just hallucinations. That the 12 disciples all had the same hallucination, that 120 people in the upper room had the same hallucination, that maybe 500 people that Paul talked about later had the same hallucination. You can tell I have some objections to that objection as well. Um, but we're not going to talk about either of those. The, the third one that I want to present is called a, a conspiracy um, theory. And this is, this is where I want to sit. It's the idea that the disciples stole and hid Jesus' body, and then they decided amongst themselves to lie about it to the world. And that's one main objection to the idea that Jesus was raised from the dead, that it was all a conspiracy. And this really answers the objection that we faced. Jesus never really came back to life. The gospel writers were just liars. How do we answer that? The rest of what I'm gonna, um, how I'm going to talk through this here really comes out of a book called Cold Case Christianity. And this is a book written by a man named J. Warner Wallace, cool name, um, who was a homicide detective in California. Now, he, this gentleman was an atheist, and his specialty in the force um, was to review cold cases. And so these were homicides that had happened 10, 20, <coughs> 30 years before, and they were never solved. 
And so he would take the binder down off the shelf and he would look through stuff and he would do some more research and his goal was to solve these cold cases. So one of, his, um, one of the folks on the force with him, or several friends, I guess, um, challenged him to put his cold case detective skills to use trying to disprove the resurrection. Um, and he ended up becoming a Christian through it. And it, it's a really cool story, a really cool book. I really like his approach um, to how he kind of digs through that. But he addresses one, one small part. He addresses this idea that the resurrection was just a conspiracy among the disciples. And here's what he says. As, as a police officer, whenever he would have multiple suspects, um, in order to prevent a conspiracy, one of the first things he would do was separate them, right? And so in, in order to have a successful conspiracy, he says there's five things, at, at the minimum, there's five things that have to, have to happen in order for a successful conspiracy to happen. Um, they are, has to be a small number of conspirators. There has to be ongoing communication. It has to happen over a short time span. There has to be significant relational connections. And there has to be little or no pressure to cave. So, so those five things, let's look at those in view of the resurrection and the disciples and see what come up, we come up with. So conspiracy requires a small number of conspirators. So Acts 1.15 talks about there being as many as 120 eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, resurrected Jesus all at once in one place. So that's 120. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about as many as 500 plus people who all saw Jesus risen. And he even makes the point to say, there's, a lot of them are still alive. You should go ask them if you have any doubts about it. But for the sake of argument here, let's only consider the 12 original disciples. Oh, not the original. Judas was out, Matthias was in. But the 12 disciples, um, even if you only consider those 12 men, that's still too large a group to have a successful conspiracy in light of all these other points. And let's go through them. The second one, ongoing communication. In order to have a successful conspiracy, you need to know that you're not the last one still holding on to the lie. If you're familiar with game theory, this is where the prisoner's dilemma comes into play. Where, where if, if you've got the two prisoners or suspects, whatever, that are separated, well, what if he's telling the truth and I'm continuing the lie, but I'm just digging a hole for myself. Maybe I should just tell the truth. That, that's the idea of having ongoing communication. Are, am I alone in this? And if you think, if you look historically at the 12 apostles and where they were at when they ended up dying, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but you had some in Italy all the way over to India. They didn't have text messages, they didn't have email, <laughs> they didn't have Snapchat, they didn't have any way to communicate with each other over these hundreds and thousands of mile distances to confirm if the jig was up or not. There's no way that the conspiracy could have held in light of how far apart they were if they were lying. And third thing, a short time span. Telling a lie once is difficult enough, coming up with something that's plausible, feasible. Um, but having to do it over and over again over a long period of time becomes more and more difficult. Um, for instance, have you ever, as an adult, maybe shared a story with your siblings or maybe even directly with your parents about something you did as a kid that after sharing the story, you realize, oh, mom and dad didn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Amy, you remember that show we watched and that one episode where the guy did this and mom's like, excuse me, what's going on? <laughs> when did you watch that? Oops, because as time goes on, it's more and more difficult to keep the lie straight. It's more and more difficult to remember what story you made up. See, when you're telling the truth, you can remember what happened and you can say what happened. When you're telling a lie, you have to remember what you made up that happened and over time, as your experiences change, your recollection of what you maybe made up, you might want to make up something different to, to fit new thoughts in your heads or new understandings of the world, whatever. And so the longer you have to hold on to the lie, the more difficult it is. The last of the apostles that we know of was the Apostle John, who died 60 years after Jesus was raised. 60 years. So that means for the, for the apostles, 
he had to hold on to it for 60 years, some of them for, what, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, that they would have to maintain this lie. It doesn't fit in a successful conspiracy. Um, fourth, significant relational connections. If, if the police comes knocking at your door um, and they're looking for a family member of yours who's hiding out in, in the upstairs bedroom or something, you are much more likely to lie about them in their defense than you would be, say, for a stranger who happened to bust down the back door that morning and is hiding upstairs. If you have a significant relational connection to someone, you're much more likely to hold on to a lie for them. How does that apply to the disciples? Well, you did have some brothers. You had like Peter and Andrew were brothers. You had James and John who were brothers, and they even worked together some. But then you also have guys like Matthew, the tax, tax collector, who was this Roman, uh, or it, was, it was a Jew, but was working for the Romans, collecting taxes to fund the Roman occupation of Israel. And then on the other side of things, you've got this guy named Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were these guys who were super anti-Rome, even to the point that they were doing assassinations and everything. These two guys had no reason in the world to lie to protect each other. Think about that. These are guys from different walks of life, different social statuses. They had no relational connection. And then the fifth thing, little or no pressure. If, if, you ha if there's no pressure on you to crack, you're much less likely to crack. But the more the pressure comes on, the more likely you are to crack and to, to tell the truth rather than holding on to the lie. Again, what do we see with the apostles? Nearly every single one of them, historically speaking, we see suffered because they held on to the idea that Jesus was bodily resurrected from the dead. They suffered, they were persecuted, they were tortured, and most of them were martyred, died, executed for their faith. What does that tell us? See, if why would you die for something that you knew was a lie? Why? Why would you go that far? They didn't gain any power from it. They didn't gain any prestige. They didn't gain any financial gain. They had, uh, there was nothing relationally that they gained out of this. What was their motive if this was a lie? There was a lot of pressure on them to give up. In short, the relatively small group of 12 men, <laughs> if we don't consider the 120, if we don't consider the 500, could not have maintained a conspiracy like this. They were spread too far apart and remained consistent over too many years while facing intense persecution. They had no way to confirm if the jig was up and no relational motive to hold on for their fellow liars if that's what they were. And not to mention, they lost everything because of it. I really, really like this um, approach to, to looking at the, the resurrection um, because of a story that was shared um, on the radio. It's been shared for years, actually, because the gentleman who shared it is dead now. Um, but I heard it this last Easter on a podcast, and that's the story of Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson, if you don't know, um, was Richard Nixon's hatchet man. Um, he's part of the Watergate scandal. And after he had gone to jail, um, he actually became a Christian. And this argument right here is one of the reasons he became a Christian. Let me read it in his words. In comparing the Watergate scandal to the scandal of the resurrection, it says, there were no more than a dozen of us. Could we maintain a cover-up to save the president? Consider that we were political zealots. We enjoyed enormous political power and prestige. With all that at stake, you'd expect us to be capable of maintaining a lie to protect the president. But we couldn't do it. The first to crack was John Dean. First he told the president everything, and then just two weeks later he went to the prosecutors and offered to testify against the president. His reason, as he candidly admits in his memoirs, was to save his own skin. After that, everyone started scrambling to protect himself. What we know today is the great Watergate cover-up lasted only three weeks. Some of the most powerful politicians in the world, and we couldn't keep alive for more than three weeks. So back to the question of historicity of Christ's resurrection. Can anyone believe that for 50 years that Jesus' disciples were willing to be ostracized, beaten, 
persecuted, and all but one of them suffer a martyr's death without ever renouncing their conviction that they had seen Jesus bodily resurrected. Does anyone really think the disciples could have maintained a lie all that time under that kind of pressure? No. Someone would have cracked just as we did so easily in Watergate. Someone would have acted as John Dean did and turned state's evidence. There would have been some kind of smoking gun or a deathbed confession. So why didn't they crack? Because they had come face to face with the living God. They could not deny what they had seen. The fact is that people will give their lives for what they believe is true, but they will never give their lives for what they know is a lie. The Watergate cover-up proves that 12 powerful men in modern America couldn't keep a lie, and that 12 powerless men 2,000 years ago couldn't have been telling anything but the truth. See, giving a reasoned defense for the gospel, for the proof and evidence for Jesus and for the Bible can be so powerful. Here's my bottom line. The story is true. The story is true. And when we encounter the objections to the faith, when we encounter doubts in our own mind to the faith, God wants us and has even asked us to be ready to give a defense for the hope that we have. There's evidence out there that firmly supports the faith. So what do I want you to do with this? First thing, when in doubt, investigate you don't just have to hold on tighter. You can go ask questions. You can look for answers. God can take your doubts. He really can. And, and something that's so amazing about our time in history is that we live in the information age. And Christians have been asked these questions. They've seen these objections over and over again throughout the millennia and have come up with really reasoned, really well-reasoned, really good arguments in defense of the faith. And we live in a time where we can access it from our pocket. That's where we live. So when in doubt, investigate. And I'm going to give you guys some homework. I hope you do this. Here's an exercise. Pick one objection, common objection to Christianity, and work through it this week to build a reasonable defense to build a reasoned defense. I, I'm going to give you maybe a list of, I'm going to give you a list of questions. Maybe you want to choose from those. Um, and then I'm going to give you guys some resources. Um, but maybe this is something you can do with a spouse or with your kid or with a small group um, or maybe even someone you know who has this specific doubt. Okay, let's look at this question. Let's try and answer it this week. What does it look like? And once you've done your research, once you come up with an answer, go one step further promise you won't regret it, summarize it in one to three sentences. If you can do that, that's something that you can remember. That's a tool you can always have with you and be ready to give as a reasoned defense of the gospel. So, some questions you might want to address. Does God exist? How can God be good when evil and suffering exist? Why shouldn't all religions be true? Um, Jesus never even claimed to be God. Why should I believe in Jesus' resurrection? Why should I trust that the Bible is the word of God? Is the Bible historically accurate? Is Jesus' story isn't Jesus' story just a copy of pagan myths? Isn't the Bible full of contradictions? Those are some ideas of questions you might want to address. But again, maybe there's something that you are personally struggling with and doubting. Investigate it. Uh, these are also going to be um, on the website and on social media, um, so don't feel like you have to write all this down, but if something pops out to you, go for it. Now, here's some resources I want to offer. Um, I mentioned Cold Case Christianity. It's a book. It's a website, um, and this is a really fun approach. It's just a little bit different perspective than some of the other ways I've heard of approaching the evidence for the resurrection. Um, so, Cold Case Christianity. There's Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. He takes a journalist um, perspective. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist by Norman Geisler and Frank Turek. This is a little bit of a headier one. It's a little bit of a more difficult read, but maybe you're at the point where you want something that's kind of that detailed. Um, the Historical Jesus by Gary Habermas, and his website is such an amazing trove of information. Um, he's got so many different links to talks, to articles that he's written, um, ev even scholarly papers if you want to go that far. 
but maybe from the other side of things, More Than a Carpenter by Josh and Sean McDowell. This is a, a father-son duo. And this is a really good, if, if you're just starting to dive into this, this is a really good start. I would highly recommend More Than a Carpenter. It's really accessible. Some different websites you can go to, crossexamine.org, str.org, stands for Stand to Reason, um, seanmcdowell.org, I mentioned him as one of the authors, his dad, Josh McDowell. His website is josh.org. Can you believe it? How did the guy get that URL? Um, reasonablefaith.org, or, or one that I really like is carm.org, C-A-R-M. And this is one that the website isn't like real modern or anything. It doesn't look the greatest, but it is really easy to drill down and to find an answer for the objection you're looking for. It's a really good resource. And then I, I also, I'm a big fan of YouTube, so I want to present a couple of YouTube options. One is what would you say videos. These are put out by the Colson Center. They answer common objections to Christianity, common cultural uh, things that are going on um, in a really succinct one to three sentence sort of way. Really, really good. And then also Red Pen Logic, put out by the Reasonable um, Faith Group as well. That again are short videos that are really accessible, really well done. Okay. See guys, the story is true. And when you face the habaneros <laughs> in life, you can drink the milk. You don't have to be afraid. Um, and you don't have to just hold on tighter. But God has given us evidence, and he calls us to use that evidence to give a defense. And here's the kicker. If the story is true, and that changes everything. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then he is who he said he was. And God has spoken through the person of Jesus Christ. And that means we have a hope for the future. We can look forward to the hope that we have for things we don't yet see. That's what faith is about. Because we have this evidence standing behind all of it. We have a hope that when a young girl dies well before her time, like there's ever proper time for it. That there's a hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for the hope that we have. I thank you that you have called us to be prepared, to grow in our faith in you, and that you have given us evidence for your existence, given us evidence of proving the Bible, that what you say in there is true, that Jesus really did rise from the dead, Lord, thank you for being a reliable God. For all these things in Jesus' name, amen.